Thank you for highlighting the fact that the, the Pakistani uh, nuclear program is not a, a sub-regional issue, that it is a, a, an issue with, which has, as part of this uh, uh, nuclear landscape, has uh, great consequences uh, far beyond the, the Indian subcontinent. Let me now turn to Carlo Masala, last but not least, uh, with a, a, a provocative title for his presentation, which uh, uh, we am um, looking forward to. Hello. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Camille. Completely. Um, thanks to both organizations for uh, inviting me uh, <clears throat> to talk to you. Um, yeah, right. I mean, the, the, pres the title of the presentation is Don't Beat a Dead Horse. Um, and the intention is uh, to reflect a bit on the effectiveness of the NPT in um, controlling nuclear proliferation in the past, uh, currently, and in the future, because I have some doubts uh, that the NPT really played, is playing, and will play a major effort in uh, nuclear non-proliferation. Um, since I was told by my academic teachers always to start with a kind of metaphor or funny story, I don't have a funny story, but I have a, probably a metaphor, is um, there used to be a, a high-level civil servant in the Habsburg administration who was called Wolfram von Kempel, and he developed uh, the first chess machine. And he claimed that this was uh, like a chess computer nowadays is, and it was a machine made out of wood, and there was a wooden puppet which was uh, dressed like a Turkish sultan, so it was called the Chess Turk. And he traveled around Vienna, London, Paris, impressed a lot of people because this Chess Turk played chess against real human beings and always won, until it was discovered that in the box there was a dwarf uh, who played chess. And there was a dwarf chess master. Uh, and since then, at least in German, uh, building a Turk means nothing else than attributing a certain effect to a non-existing cause. And I think that's exactly uh, what happens to the non-proliferation treaty. Um, the non-proliferation treaty, and I saw this even with Yair, who took most of my points away, uh, so I can be very short and you can have dinner, but uh, even Yair is influenced by a very powerful narrative which argues that the NPT played a direct and meaningful role in the decision of states to forego acquiring nuclear weapons. So liberal arms control, and I'm really hesitating to use this word here in Israel because it has a different meaning, but liberal arms control ayatollahs, like my German colleague uh, Harald Müller, uh, who, who can't nowadays ignore that the tendency uh, to proliferate is escalating, uh, they call for the strengthening of a treaty, the reform uh, to um, get out of this uh, tendency of nuclear proliferation, and they put a heavy emphasis on the treaty itself and on the reform of the treaty. But even skeptics of the NPT bought into this very powerful myth about uh, the power of the NPT, when they argue, and I quote uh, Henry Sokolsky, that the regime is largely ineffectual when it comes to states that actively seek to acquire nuclear weapons. So both sides, the skeptics and the fans of the NPT, they see the strengthening of the NPT as central to fight the tendency of proliferation. So the question where they disagree is how to do best. I think that from an analytical point of view, and I'm an academic, so um, since a long time, luckily, I'm no longer in, in a policy position, I find this quite astonishing since we don't have no empirical evidence that states abstained in the past from going nuclear because of their treaty membership or because of its legal commitments. Yair, you said it was a norm, and I would question this. Non-proliferation was never a norm in that respect that states socialized within this norm and abstained from going nuclear because they wanted to adhere to the norm. I think that in the past, oh, just a side remark and, uh, to um, Camille, and therefore I don't think that this is a circular argument, that we don't have any empirical evidence that the NPT as a regime or as a norm, if I use the term, uh, contributed to non-proliferation. What we know, especially about those states who gave up their programs, is that we, writ large, the West, we bought them off. 
So, and especially with Brazil and Argentine, there was a hell of money involved to convince them that it would be better not to go uh, nuclear. With South Africa, there was a lot of political debate in the transition phase, and uh, quote unquote, there was um, some racism uh, from the West included, not to give to the new government nuclear weapons. So basically, we bought them off. And it has nothing to do with the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty that they basically gave up their weapon programs. Uh, historically speaking, and here I do agree with Yair 100%, and I think that's the major problem, the NPT worked perfectly during the Cold War because the great nuclear powers considered themselves, in the words of uh, uh, Hadley Bull, as managers of the international system. And despite all their controversies, they had a common interest in preventing nuclear proliferation. And that was the point where most of the times they worked together. And this collapsed with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The US tried to basically stay manager of this international system and failed because of its military political and economic supremacy. It was no longer accepted in the field of proliferation as the manager of the international system. And I think th since then, I mean basically since the 90s, the early 90s, the nuclear order suffers exactly from that. That we don't have the management of the system which upheld a certain nuclear order. We don't have a shared idea of what the nuclear order of the 21st century should look like. And if you look nowadays, proliferation, take the Iranian case, take North Korea, is especially a problem because China and Russia do not share the same vision of the future nuclear order as the US does. And as long as this is the case that nuclear great powers, call them still superpowers, I don't know which term is correct, do not subscribe to a common vision of a nuclear order, it will be very difficult to manage this nuclear proliferation system on a global scale. That's my first point. I will be very short. I, don't, I have only three points. Um, so the lack of management, the lack of a shared vision of a nuclear order is, according to me, the major problem we are facing today and in, in the foreseeable future. As long as this does not change, there will be a tendency to proliferate because it lacks counterbalancing forces who are able to convince countries not to go nuclear. I think you can see that very clearly uh, with the uh, Iranian, Iranian file. The second myth, and it was mentioned today, is associated with the argument that the NPT is so great and it shows that this, this is the most universal treaty we have. Of course quick fact check, that's right. I mean, I think everyone basically, almost every state in, in the interna current international system is part of the NPT. But if you look deeper, and, and then you can go back to history, most, I haven't counted them, but I would say 70, 75, 80% of those states, they don't have any interest in going nuclear. So for them it's quite easy to subscribe to this regime because they don't either Either they, they lack the technical and financial capacities to do so, or they have mechanisms, and here I'm talking about alliances, security guarantees, deterrence mechanism, extended deterrence mechanisms, um, which makes them possible to abstain uh, from acquiring own nuclear weapons simply because nuclear weapons are costly and it's much cheaper to have security, external security guarantees. So most of the countries in the NPT, or for most of the countries of the NPT, signing the NPT is not a big deal because they don't have any intention of going nuclear. If you look for the causes of countries going nuclear, and here I refer to this famous uh, article of Scott Sagan, I mean, you have the three levels, the domestic, the regional, and the international. Of course, you will always have reasons in specific historical situations, in specific geographical situations to go nuclear. And those countries who perceived to have reasons <laughs> to go nuclear didn't stop because they were members of the NPT. 
And here you have the third, the smallest category. So therefore, Bruno, I, I totally share that there is no great desire uh, for a lot of countries in the future to go nuclear. Yeah, not because the regime works, because they don't have any reasons, neither domestically speaking, nor regionally speaking, nor speaking uh, if you look at the broader international setting. Um, the third category of states, and these are the most interesting ones, they may have concluded, and I think in the Iranian case, the North Korean case, we saw that, even historically speaking, Brazil and Argentine, that... It is possible to accomplish a great deal in the pursuit of nuclear weapons under the NPT. So it was a strategic decision to join the NPT in order to go nuclear. Because adhering to the NPT facilitates access to nuclear technology, and this nuclear technology can create options. And what I was told by a colleague of mine, I'm not an expert in that, so maybe I'm wrong, that if you are part of the NPT, the deal you have with the International Atomic Energy Organization Commission is a much, it's not as tight as if you are not part of the NPT. So the NPT provides you with a cover to go nuclear if you want. So this is a very rational strategic choice. So in, in, to sum up, um, I don't see, and maybe I'm wrong, and I'm ready to be corrected in that respect, I don't see how the NPT contributed in the past or currently, and I would assume even in the future, to stop nuclear proliferation. Because the reasons for nuclear proliferations are outside the NPT. And historically speaking, the policies to prevent states from going nuclear were based mostly on great power politics decision and not on the mechanisms uh, provided by the NPT. So the, the NPT might have at best a secondary effect uh, but not a primary effect on uh, the decision of states uh, to abstain from acquiring nuclear weapon. What is key, and I just repeat myself, is that we don't have a common shared vision by nuclear great powers on what the second nuclear age should look like. And as long as, this, as long as we lack this vision, as long as we lack a common interest by Russia, China, I would include nowadays China too, which historically speaking didn't play that, that kind of a major role. By Russia, China and the US, I don't see how a strengthening of the NPT, how a reform of the NPT will prohibit basically this tendency we see uh, that we're moving into the second nuclear age with more nuclear states. Maybe not as many as some people uh, are afraid of, but actually that we will see in the future a couple of new nuclear powers. And by having said this, I stop. Thanks. Thank you very much.